Welcome to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. I am your host, Dr. Oni Lev, an emergency and addiction doctor who has served at the White House and still practices on the front lines. Right here on High Truths, you will learn from experts, hear stories from the emergency department, and listen to people who have struggled from addiction. Friends, fentanyl is plaguing America. It has infected all illicit drugs, from cocaine to meth, counterfeit pills, and even marijuana. If you're around someone who may be using drugs, you should carry naloxone, the opioid reversal agent. Carrying naloxone for drugs is like carrying an EpiPen for allergies. If you need a prescription for naloxone, you should have one, no questions asked. That is why I'm offering a free prescription to anyone who needs one. Come visit me on hightruths.com to learn more about the show, submit a question, or download a free prescription for naloxone. And if you like the show, do me a favor. Give us a five-star review and subscribe. Your stars are very much appreciated and go a long way in supporting the program. Today's episode is sponsored by Families Against Fentanyl. FAF is an organization set on breaking the status quo of failed solutions and to get to the core of the supply chain of deadly fentanyl. Learn more about FAF by visiting familiesagainstfentanyl.org and sign their petition to declare illegal fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction. Hello again, High Truth listeners. Get ready for a conversation about fake stuff. I'm your host, Dr. Oneet Lev. What is fake stuff? Well, we're talking about fake news. That is information that's false. It's not true. It's phony. And today we're going to talk about fake pills, pills with false and misleading appearance of what they contain. Here are headlines from the Los Angeles Times, February 2nd, 2022. Some pharmacies in Mexico passing off fentanyl and methamphetamine as legitimate pharmaceuticals. The LA Times found that in Tijuana, Pills sold as oxycodone tested positive for fentanyl, and pills sold as Adderall tested positive for methamphetamine. The pills are indistinguishable from their legitimate counterparts. So many people, especially from Southern California, cross the border to Mexico to buy things cheaper, including prescription drugs. How does a consumer know if a pharmacy in Mexico is selling real or fake pills? Prescriptions are more expensive in the United States than most of the world. Now, that's just not right. And please listen to High Truth episode number 36 with Gerald Posner, author of Big Pharma, to learn more about prescription pricing. However, in seeking a bargain in prescription pricing, is that worth the gamble for your life? There is no safe drug supply unless it comes from a pharmacy with your name on it. And perhaps I should add, and not from a pharmacy in Mexico. And with that, let's hear our question of the day. Hello, Dr. Lev. My name is Christina Ivazas. I'm a health education program coordinator with Placer County Public Health. We are uh, in a small, rural, and partially suburban community in Northern California. And fentanyl is so deadly and poisoning, killing our young people and um, youth and young adults with only one pill that they can become poisoned with and take their life. What do you think is the message that we should be sending our youth and parents? Thank you for your show, really appreciate it. It's such important information. I just wish everyone could hear it. Thank you, Christina, for your education to Placer County and for your question. I appreciate the compliments to the podcast, and I love sharing my opinion on appropriate messaging to youth and parents about drugs. And I want to bring someone in with lived experience for another opinion, and we will find out whether we're on the same page or not. Ed Ternan has lived experience with drug overdoses, tragically the worst kind of experience. His son, Charlie, died of a fentapil. Charlie took what he thought was oxycodone, but I would say he was murdered by fentanyl. 
Ed and his wife Mary have formed a nonprofit charity called Song for Charlie, where they create and distribute social media campaigns and educational materials. To learn more about Ed Ternan and Song for Charlie, please check out the High Truth show notes. Ed Ternan, welcome to High Truths. Hi, Dr. Lev. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I'm so glad we finally got to connect. Um, I've been hearing about your work, learning about Charlie, visiting your amazing um, website with so much great material. But I wanted our listeners to learn a little bit about you and about Charlie and the song for Charlie. Oh, great. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, We have really been... Uh, on a mission not of our making is one way to look at it. Uh, My wife, Mary, and I, since we lost Charlie in May 2020, um, we started asking a lot of questions and knocking on some doors. And every question we asked added led to another question. And every door we opened led to another door. And um, because most of what we do is online and through social media, we've... um, kind of developed a national footprint. Um, And so uh, I I tell Mary, we kind of are are riding this tiger and we couldn't get off even if we wanted to. I mean, we have this platform that we can leverage to take our message, which is essentially to warn young people and parents and families about the new risk of this chemical drug landscape they're up against now. Um, We have this web platform that we can leverage to bring that message out as widely as we can. And so that's what we're doing full time now. And you came to that, right? That was your profession before Charlie died. I, I've I've had, uh, for better or worse, a how to describe it, a varied professional career. Um, I've worked in a number of different industries, from construction products to internet startups to um, government contracting to financial advisory. Um, And so I bounced around a little bit and had a lot of interesting, uh, diverse experiences. Uh, My role in each of those, though, has always been as a marketing marketing product manager or program manager, uh, where my job is to look at a market uh, or an industry and find opportunities to develop new products or new programs, uh, and then put those programs together and, and sell them. Uh, and so that is, I'm using some of that experience, right, with, with what we're trying to do at Song for Charlie. In, in a weird way, we're, we're on a mission. It's a passion project. It's because we lost our son and we're dealing with very tragic circumstances. But if you, in a way, we have to think about it like a business. And when we talk in those terms, we say to ourselves, essentially, we're a communications company. We're developing and distributing content around this topic, and we're trying to push it out to the right demographic as efficiently as we can. And that I have experience doing that. That's great. You know, I don't know if you know um, Laura Stack. Um, she uh, lost her son to cannabis-induced psychosis for marijuana, and she kind of pivoted too. She took all the the, the skills that she had in her um, previous career as um uh, an efficiency expert and and mm. turn that into advocacy. I don't know if you you know her, but it sounds similar. Like you have this tragedy and your skills that you've had in your career pivot to to help others. And that's pretty amazing. Yeah. I think that's it's not uncommon. When you lose a child, uh, it sets you on a new course no matter what. And then you have decisions to make about what you will make of that, your new life essentially. There's no going back to your to your old life. And in our world where Mary and I are in the fentanyl crisis, the counterfeit pills uh, specifically, uh, the targeting of uh, deceptive practices by drug dealers at young people, um, that's a new and, and shocking and very dangerous trend. And we all need to change and and develop a national response to this this new drug landscape. And I'm convinced that the change we're going to see in the country is ultimately being driven by family advocates like Song for Charlie. Absolutely. Who, you know, lost kids, and we know dozens of them. And uh, sadly, we, we see new ones springing up. We have people pinging us and say, I just lost my son six months ago, or my daughter, finally kind of emerging from this fog 
and I'm concerned by what I've learned and I want to do something. Here's what I've done. And they're not coming to us for advice. They're do, taking these projects on themselves and just making stuff happen in their local community or in their state or nationwide. And it's really starting to have an impact. Yeah. I, I Sadly, I've seen that with prescription drugs when, 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 when children were dying of prescription drugs from the medical community, that's how I came about, and I got activated by parents, and I do to this day. I do what I do because of people like you, Ed, and 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 so tell us about Charlie, and why is it called Song for Charlie? Yeah, Charlie was our youngest of uh, three children. Um, we have, Charlie has uh, an older brother and an older sister, um, and he was just a maybe a, a stereotypical third child, uh, kind of a stealth sense of humor, not the loudest guy necessarily in the room, but he'd have that dry comment somewhere. Um, uh, a listener, um, very empathetic guy. He drew friends to him. And, and, you know, you learn a lot about your kid after they pass. There, a lot of Charlie's friends came forward. We hear this from other parents who just say, hey, I don't think you ever knew this about your child, but this is something nice they did for me. Um, we hear a lot of stories about Charlie helping young people who are stressed out, uh, worried about stuff. Um, so very empathetic. Uh, he was a big, strong guy, like six foot two. Um, played some high school football and rugby, uh, also very smart. Um, and so he went off to, uh, to college and started as an engineering, uh, as an engineer and then, and then changed his major to economics, uh, very smart in math. And the, the, the name of the organization, uh, really came to us kind of cosmically. Um, the day after Charlie died, um, and we got a phone call from a good friend of Charlie's named Jack Symes, Symes with a Y, S-Y-M-E-S. And she, Jack is a young singer songwriter, very good friends with Charlie's cousin, who we all grew up near, uh, like two and a half, three years older than Charlie. But he's a singer songwriter, had some stuff on Spotify, had a record or two out. And Charlie was like a super fan. Charlie's a big music guy, movies. He could quote movie lines, you know, he's He's got older siblings and baby boomer parents. So he knows Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers and, you know, all through the, the you know, the ages and the decades. Um, well, Jack called us the day after Charlie died. And I get emotional when I talk about this, but he said, um, um, I want to play you this song I wrote yesterday. I heard that Charlie died. I went down to the dock. I'm here in North Carolina with my girlfriend's family. I went down by the water and I wrote this song called song. I call it song for Charlie. And it was just beautiful. You can hear it. It's on our website. And a couple of months later, as we thought, maybe we should put up a little website and see if we can tell parents what we're learning about this problem. Um, we thought to ourselves, what a great name for a nonprofit. It reflects Charlie's spirit and it reflects the hope that we're trying to bring to the problem. Right. So we're trying to really be hopeful. And a big part of our message is that young people, you need to engage with this problem. Us older folks, we have not figured this out for 50 or 100 years. It's gotten way more dangerous than it ever was. This is your problem. Step up, get involved and, and fix it. And we believe you can if you all join together. So Song for Charlie just seemed hopeful and uplifting and it reflected Charlie's personality. It was very easy for us to say this is what Charlie would want us to, to call his organization. That's beautiful. It really is beautiful. Um, so Christina Ivazes is a public health uh, educator in Placer County, and she's also very worried about the issue of fentanyl. And her question to both of us um, is, what message do we send youth and parents about fentanyl? Who wants to go first? You go first, and then I'll, I'll piggyback. Right. And, and, I, and I'll warn you and your question, your, your questioners, I like to joke that my core competence is giving long answers to short questions. So uh, I, I will preface my answer by saying we're pretty deliberate about how we talk to young people. And we've done some homework on that. Uh, we've talked to drug educators and child psychologists and, and counselors and also the people we work with in the social media industry who understand what how messages land with with young people. Um, we really do take a more of a public health warning approach than a moralistic um, kind of don't do drugs, drugs are bad. It's a non-judgmental message. And 
it, it goes something like this. Um, the drug landscape has completely changed and you can't know for sure what's in any bag or any tablet that's out there. And so you have to be, you have to know more than ever what's going on out there. So you need to get engaged, research, talk to your friends, go to songforcharlie.org and other resources to get smart. So we say, just say no, but we spell it K-N-O-W because if the drug landscape is like a minefield these days, the first th choice you have to make when you know there's a minefield is number one, you don't have to go in there. You could avoid it altogether. But if you venture out there, you really need to know the lay of the land. So it's very informative. We were counseled early on that kids today really do consume information differently than they used to because of the internet and social media and so forth. So rather than telling people, be careful for yourself because young adolescent brains feel bulletproof and are, are prone to risk taking, we say watch out for your friends because they're also very, have very strong peer affinity, right? And we also, instead of saying, don't do this, don't do that, do this instead, we say, here's what you need to know. Here's where to go to learn more on your own, because kids, when they go and research something, it, the, the messaging gets in better. So those are two like key top level takeaways that, that we've learned that we, it seems to be working for us so far. Wow. I, I really love that. And that, I mean, I've, I've talked to a lot of people and I, I really appreciate how you say how to get into the brain, how to get that. And again, from the marketing guy, how do you message that? I think that that's brilliant uh, and uh, let you know how to get that information and make your own decision um, mm -hmm. and just say no, K-N-O-W, love that. All right, so my, I don't know if I'll be a, a sort, so my, I think broader, um, uh, so I think the messaging you really show how to get the message in, but I'm thinking like the content of what the general message should be. Um, and it depends on the cohort of the population. So for youth who don't use drugs, there are kids out there that don't use drugs. And actually the data shows that um, over time, the population that doesn't use any alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, or any other drugs has gone up from almost 3% in 1983 to 37% in 2022 of kids who just don't use drugs. So the message is, good job, that's the social norm, and you know, protect yourself um, because there is a minefield out there, like you mentioned. And then there's a subgroup of people who may occasionally use drugs, and that message is, what you said, fentanyl is in everything. There's no safe drug supply. And so you have to be careful. Um, and then finally, there's a cohort of people who have a substance use disorder. They are right. addicted to whatever. And the message for them is there's treatment. And if that's not working along with that, there's harm reduction. So I separate into cohorts because what I see is people run into meetings and like, you're trying to teach harm reduction to my children, you know, about whatever, needles and, 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 and fentanyl strips, and they don't use drugs. That message is not appropriate for those kids, just as it's inappropriate to someone who is on the streets, heavily addicted to say, well, just stop it. Well, okay, well, that's not so easy, right? right, right. <laughs> so, um, so, so same thing. So I like to divide the, 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 the cohorts. And anyway, that's my answer to Christina. <laughs> right. And, and my non-medical comment to, to that would be, I'm just so happy to hear you say that. That's basic marketing 101. That's market segmentation, right? You divide your market into different segments and you tailor your message for each one. And one of the things that the roles that, that we play or that I play is I come into this with fresh legs and fresh eyes. So I don't have institutional bias and I haven't made a career of this. So I'm asking a lot of questions and we say, we don't want to confront anyone, but we want to challenge everyone. And so um, part of the things I think one of the things we need to overcome is this kind of blanket approach to stuff where, you know, we're going to have one message about drugs. Well, there are, there are several different segments of that demographic that we need to address. And the things that work for people with substance use disorder don't apply to a 15-year-old experimenter. So let's tailor our messages to each one so, to get through. That's right. 
Right. So it makes me think of, do you, did you see those um, posters that New York City had in the busways, mm -hmm. you know, like use safer? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember seeing that. They had a huge yeah. public health marketing campaign. And for kids, they'd be like, what is this? You want me to use drugs? Like they don't get it. It, it, it was for a subset of the population that they were reaching that may be appropriate, but they really lost the rest of the population. Right. And a, a, another uh, marketing uh, concept, maybe the message was right, but the distribution channel was wrong. So one, that's one of the things that we say about all the videos and so forth that we produce. There's the content and there's the distribution. What is it? And then where should it go? And a message like that doesn't it's not necessary. It's not the most useful place to put it on the subways. It's just not. It's not for. It's not a general public message, right? It's a more targeted message. So wow, you do you do so much and you think so this through. When you song for Charlie, if um, is that available? Like for Christina, who works in public health in, in Placer County, can she come to you? Use your materials. Um, um, do you have education on which? you know, market to, to teach what? Is that something that you do? We absolutely do. Um, and if you're in Placer County, you surely know Laura Didier, who works with us and does school assemblies all over the state of California and does a really great job of public speaking and, and getting the message out, working with the people in Placer County. Um, and on our website, we really did from the very get-go say, we want to create stuff and give it away for free. So um, we have different resources for different groups from kind of high level. We have a current data page that takes the proprietary opinion research we've conducted to survey Gen Z people about what they know about fentanyl and fake pills. And then we have uh, John Epstein, who works with us. He's a bereaved dad out of Portland, uh, and he's real good at, at data analysis and converting data into information. So he puts that together with CDC data and so forth. I think Song for Charlie really is a leader in looking at the fentanyl problem through the youth lens. Um, and then we have toolkits available for high schools and colleges. So we've segmented those age groups. We are just now piloting a youth peer-to-peer -peer program that the kids have named Fentanyl Fight Club. And, and so the messaging there and the tools in that toolkit are a little bit different as well. So we really are trying, and all of that is free. It's all on the website, it's on our YouTube channel, and we encourage people to go use it, push it out, distribute it. Because again, we can produce the content, but we need help getting it out there, right? So we need to clone ourselves with all these people in their local communities wanting to do this stuff. We wanna be the library that you go to and get good stuff. That's great. Um, so you mentioned data and you invest a lot in, in data. Um, you're critical. Uh, of the data and and statistics that uh, are out there, um, and by the definition of overdose and poisoning, and we've talked about that um, on on high truths before, where it's kind of unfair to say that Charlie overdosed when he accidentally just. And not even accidentally, it could be me, even maliciously murdered mm -hmm. by, he thought he bought a Percocet, but he got mm -hmm. fentanyl and died, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's not, oh, I took too much of Percocet. He, he was murdered. He was um, cheated mm -hmm. out of life. Yeah. That's right. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm only bringing, I'm only talking in this way because we're talking about my marketing background, but again, as a word guy, um, I understand that there are terms of art, right? And so overdose is a term of art. It's a legacy term from, uh, you know, medical examiners and law enforcement and so forth that's been around forever. And it is technically correct. And there are still people who overdose on fentanyl. So rather than saying, being real militant about every fentanyl death is a, is a poisoning on an overdose, it's more nuanced than that. It's about agency, right? So the first point is, and I like to use this analogy with Jack Daniels, so because everybody understands it. So if I go to the store and I say, I'd like a handle of Jack Daniels, please, and I take that bottle home and I drink the whole bottle and I die, that is an overdose of Jack Daniels. I've taken too much of a substance and it took my life. Uh, and the culpability on that I may have had a substance use disorder or trauma or all kinds of extenuating circumstances, but ultimately the culpability can be said to be mostly on me. 
Now, if I go to the store and I say, I'd like a bottle of Jack Daniels, please. And that, that store owner sells me a handle bottle with a Jack Daniels label and brown liquid. And I go home and I take the recommended dose, which is one ounce shot. And I fall over dead because it wasn't Jack Daniels. It was cyanide and brown food coloring. That is not an overdose. I didn't take too much of the substance I intended to consume. I intended a, uh, consumed a substance unknowingly that I never intended to consume. And because I didn't understand the dosage, it killed me. Now, the culpability for that death falls ma major majorly on the seller of that product who used deceptive means to sell me a substance that killed me. And I think our law enforcement approach needs to um, be updated in that way. Now, we don't really get as a matter of policy into the weeds of legislation and different policy changes and stuff, but that doesn't mean I don't have opinions, right? And we use some blanket terms. We talked about segmenting the market before, but there's a pers persistent myth that drug dealers are victims too, that they are very frequently fellow users of the victim, it was an accident, a boyfriend or girlfriend gave someone too much heroin in the shot and they died. It would be a tragedy to double down on that, that disaster and prosecute that poor person and put them in prison for that. But that's changed. I think that's a 20 year old paradigm. Um, now, drug dealing has become very commercial and institutionalized. It happens online and on social media. It's very transactional. I can tell you that Charlie and 90% of the families I know in my world never partied with the guy who sold them that fa fatal pill. Didn't know him from Adam. So we need to separate people who, the, the acronym is people who use drugs. I think that's too broad. Like you said, there's people who need drugs. There's people who use drugs sometimes people who experiment with drugs, and then there's people who sell drugs. And one of the things we'll have to think about in a new national response is, how do we break out the drug sellers from the rest of those groups and treat them differently? Because selling products deceptively is a totally different class of crime, in, you know, in my opinion. I think there's a lot of evidence for that. And people in the harm reduction community will support that, I believe. I've talked to people in the harm reduction community who use the analogy of like a festival like Burning Man. If people were looking for ketamine and some guy was on walking around uh, uh, Burning Man and selling what he was telling people was ketamine, it was really meth, he would be run out of that festival on a rail. There would be vigilante justice. You don't deceive people about the substances you're selling them. And yet that's the business practice today of these drug, drug dealers. So we need to break that out and address that differently. And that is interesting, and I, I like your analogy. We do have teams like in San Diego, and I think there 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 are some of them around the country um, that look at an overdose as a potential murder um, site and investigate that differently. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I guess there's so many now um, mm. that you know it's, there's basically an airplane full of people dying a day. It's too many to investigate, so they have to to triage. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And perhaps, you know, um, our, my friend James Rowell uh, with Families Against Fentanyl, he... I met, met Jim, yeah. Yeah. So he, like like you, he lost his uh, son to, um, to fentanyl. And on his phone, his son's phone, they were able to find the dealer and trace the dealer to China. And he is suing the people in China and going after them for killing his son, because that's not mm. what he meant to do. So that was pretty. And he also does statistics. One of the recent, recent statistics from Families Against Fentanyl um, was how it's called changing the faces of fentanyl and how it's affecting children, babies. Mm. You know, younger than Charlie, because if you think about it, if these drugs are around parents, then their kids get into it. And the mm -hmm. number of kids at the age one to four years old, five to 14 years old has gone up 15 fold from 2015 yes. to 2021. And less than one years old, like babies crawling on the ground, the number have died of fentanyl has gone up tenfold. Yeah, it's a scary statistic. And, and Jim and his group do a great job at staying on top of all the stats and really raising awareness at all levels across the country about just the scope of the impact of this crisis. And he's what I call one of the OGs, right? He's been doing this for a long time. And, you know, we, we take a lot of cues from him and his group.
Right. And his, his group has a different focus. You're, you know, you're, you are, uh, know how to, you know, market and direct to um, youth. And his, his focus is declaring fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction and going way upstream um, uh, in, in, in preventing the supply. Yeah, that's right. And what, what we made a very conscious decision, doctor, that, um, and we can talk about this, but we were able to connect with um, uh, the social media platforms and get them to help us. And that's a little contrarian to some people, but as we've talked about, all these different family groups find their own lane and they push in different pressure areas, right? So there's there's Matt Capilouto in California trying to get this uh, Watson rule admonition passed, which is a great idea. Well, tell, um, tell us what that is. I don't. We don't know what that is. It's it's it, actually it's genius. So here in California, where like I said, it's very difficult in the current environment. And I I, I want to make clear, I work with people from all groups. Demand reduction, supply reduction, harm reduction, we talk to all of them. We have no axe to grind. Um, in California, the environment is such that it's very difficult to prosecute drug dealers. And so uh, what Matt Capilouto, who lost his daughter, Alexandra, in December 2019, about six months before Charlie, um, what he came up with was a ver- uh, basically applying the Watson rule to fentanyl dealing. The Watson rule in California is for drunk driving. So if you're arrested in California for driving under the influence, part of your sentencing is an admonition is read in front of you and into the record that says this behavior is dangerous and could uh, potentially cause loss of life. If you engage in this again and someone dies as a result, next time you could be charged with murder not just a suspended license. And so Matt took that concept and Senator Tom Umberg is the primary sponsor of this now. I think they've got like 30 co-sponsors in the California assembly uh, to date. It's finally getting some traction. He tried this two years ago and didn't get very far. Um, But it seems a very reasonable approach because you're taking first time drug dealers who are arrested. So they've already committed the crime. They've already been convicted of the crime or pled guilty. So it's not until a guilty verdict or a guilty plea that they're given this admonition that says, next time, if you do this again and kill somebody, you're going to, you could be charged with murder. So it overcomes the harm reduction of, of objection to we have statistics that says locking up street level drug dealers doesn't reduce overdose rates. That's that's the evidence-based argument that the harm reduction people make against this. Matt and his group is able to push back and say, actually, this is diversion. We are giving these dealers a chance to find a new line of work. We're warning them. They can't use the, the excuse anymore. I didn't know there was fentanyl in that pill or in that powder. We're telling them fentanyl's everywhere. And if you do this again, there's going to be serious consequences. And hopefully we will get them uh, you know, to move away from that dangerous business that they're in. So it has a better chance than ever of passing. And I'd like to see something like that. You know, that's something that goes state state by state across the country. It's, I think it's a very useful, a useful tool. That's great. Uh, yeah, I, I love these parent activists. They come up with missions. And maybe, you yeah. know, Julie Shamish um, also yeah. Yeah. and and yeah. Tyler's bill. So I, I partnered with Julie. Um, we were on the same mission and then we found each other and we passed Tyler's law, which now is the first in the country that requires any hospital. If you're going to test for meth and cocaine, why would you not include um, fentanyl? And we're hoping to take that uh, nationwide as well. Right. And and I was getting to the idea that we found, I think, our niche. And that is that while professionals like yourself, law enforcement, government, and these grassroots activists, um, and we'll use the war analogy. I think we need to move away from the war on drugs analogy, but we'll stick with it for a minute. These people are fighting the ground game. All of the changes that we need to make as a society, as a culture, as as a country uh, are going to take time because this is a seismic shift. It's a mega trend in what's going on in the drug world. And so with Song for Charlie, the way we positioned ourselves through our online presence and our partnerships with social medias and our youth focuses, we're buying our friends time 
to fight that slog of a ground game over the next few years by playing the role of the Air Force. We are carpet bombing young people and families with useful, actionable information about the new drug landscape all over the country as fast as we can so that we can reduce demand and reduce, kind of flatten the curve on these drug deaths while we figure this out as a nation. And so that's how we're hoping that what we do complements what these other parents are doing. Yeah. And, and it absolutely does. And it teaches also us. You learn from each other. Right. Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah, we compare notes and we, we collaborate and, you know, we, we're all um, on different paths. And, and, you know, at Song for Charlie, we really, as a matter of policy, we say let, we're not going to tell any other group what to do because they all have, you know, good hearts and they're grieving parents and they're trying to save other families from this fate. And they, they all have a role and specialty and they're making a difference and you need That's all right. of you. We need all of you. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a loose, it's a loose coalition, but it's, I think it's, we're in this two, two and a half years now, and we're starting to see some, some progress. And, and people like Jim Rao and Michael Gray and Virginia Krieger and Terry Almanza, they, you know, I know I'm forgetting people, but these are people who've been doing this work since 20. 15, I mean, a Jim Rao goes back a long time when he lost his son, right? And so you've got 2015, 16, 17, where these people were crying in the wilderness. Nobody was paying attention. Nobody knew what the heck they were talking about, right? So we, in a way, all stand on their, the, the foundation of what they built. And I'm hoping that they're feeling kind of vindicated that so many years later, things are finally, finally starting to get attention. And But not enough. Not enough yet. We're still got work to do, but enough. yeah, that's right. Um, so, and then Cassie, you do so much. Is that your full-time job? That, that it, yes. Yeah. Um, the story is that, that Mary and I, my wife is a gerontologist. So her job is to um, uh, work with the senior, senior citizens and their families. And she worked for our local Catholic parish for 30 years as the director of pastor of care. And she ran all of the volunteers that went out and visited homebound parish members and people in nursing homes and hospitals. And so um, she got her MBA from USC or, or her master's in gerontology from USC. So as Char when Charlie went off to college, we had already started thinking about like a, a household business that we could get into. And so um, I started, we formed an LLC. We formed a company that we called Silverwise. And, but neither one of us really quit our day jobs yet, but we had started to get some clients in the business of on our own consulting with boomer families about what do you do with mom and dad, right? As they get older. And that was just starting to get legs when in March of 2020 COVID hit. And of course that business completely changed with the lockdowns. Um, so we were in the position already of having to scramble. And then two months later, Charlie died. And so we kind of looked at each other and we started doing this a little bit, uh, chipping away at it. And when we discovered that, Hey, this is a big problem. We need to devote some time to this. Um, we kind of just pivoted. And so we formed the nonprofit and we went to friends and family and we raised some money. And, and so we are both working full time now at Songford Charlie. It's our full time job. It's, it's, it's not always easy to be immersed in this, um, such a downer of a topic all the time. So we, we try to keep our chins up and stay hopeful. Um, but it's important enough that we, we feel like we need to devote our time to it. Yeah. Um, that is, that is amazing. And, and we're all thankful for it because the materials that you, you provide and for free are amazing. I mm. thought we'd have a conversation about drugs, kind of like you mentioned with the different cohorts, but looking at the whole issue of, of, of drugs, um, from, you know, upstream to downstream and, um, and the issue of prevention science. I've had some podcasts with, um, um, scientists who are developing the field of prevention science. And they kind of think of prevention as a sinking uh, boat where you could either keep bailing out things. Um, um, I would say like, that's like naloxone, like the sink is shipping, but you got to keep things somehow going or going right to the source and plugging the hole. And I think you guys are doing that from what I, I, I see um, in, in a little bit in all the approaches. So 
Uh, I thought we'd talk about downstream, midstream, and upstream, get your take on things. So if we think about dub downstream, the, the most I think of is like harm reduction, naloxone. That's important. Fentanyl mm -hmm. strips, which you have issues with. And the whole issue is like, we're not going to arrest our way out of the problem, but you know, we're not going to naloxone our way out of the problem. But yeah, it's necessary for the really downstream. You know, it's better than dying. What What are your mm -hmm. thoughts? Yeah, it's wow, fascinating topic. So I'm glad it's a it's an hour long podcast. This is great. Uh, there is what I see, and I'm going to forget the author, and maybe you can put it in the comments or something. But I've I've read a really good book in the last year or so. Uh, it's called Scout Mindset, and uh, the author she she puts forward that there are essentially two mindsets that that. Um, that dominate our social discourse. One is soldier mindset and one is scout mindset. And so soldier mindset, if you think about all the analogies we use in our, in our uh, discussions about take a position, hold a position, defend a position, right? Those are all military analogies because that's what a soldier does. So I think there's a lot of soldier mindset embedded in the supply reduction world, which is law enforcement, demand reduction, prevention, education, and harm reduction, safe supply and naloxone and needle exchanges, that kind of thing. There's a lot of soldier mindset. We've worked really hard for years to take this position. And in the face of a changing problem, our first instinct is to defend that position, right? Scout mindset is what's the job of a scout? Right. They're both in a military unit, but the scout's job is to look out around the corner and see what's coming and report back the real facts, not colored by any biases, not colored. Not, you're not trying to make the general happy, because if you don't tell him that the enemy's around the corner because he doesn't want to hear that, everybody gets killed. So we try to take a scout mindset. We're fresh legs and fresh eyes. And. We challenge the people we work with in each of these groups to open their minds and think a little bit differently. So I'm interested in the safe supply conversation. I think that's an interesting conversation. I like to say to some people, let's we have this sense that there are illegal, unregulated drugs and safe regulated medicines. So if we take that conversation up a level and say, they're all substances. And which ones are safe and regulated versus illegal, unsafe and unregulated is a value decision that we make as a society, right? So, I mean, heroin's illegal now, it used to be legal. Marijuana used to be illegal. It's legal in a lot of places now, right? So let's have a conversation about what should be legalized and available medicinally, recreationally, that's happening in the medical world, right? With the uh, psilocybin and ketamine and so forth for psychotherapy. I Let's wouldn't have... call that medical world. Wait, wait. Oh, okay, okay, okay. sorry. I wouldn't call it the medical world because <laughs> it takes away a lot of all the years and sweat and board exams it takes to be a doctor. And, um, you know, for me to give you aspirin or amoxicillin, I have to go through a whole standard of medical practice and I think this is people playing doctor on themselves. So I just. So, like, right. OK, so and, right. and so people taking stuff on their own and dosing themselves. Right. Is, is part of the safe supply conversation. So are you going to legalize psilocybin to be administered by a professional in a clinical setting, let's say, versus taking a bunch of shrooms at a, at a festival? Two different things. And and let's have the safe supply conversation, acknowledging that we already have a safe supply and it doesn't work that well, right? We have that's why we have the opioid crisis. So, people who say it just legalizing everything will make the problem go away, that's not true. And one of the things that really gets me is this iron law of prohibition. You've heard this, right? That the only reason there's fentanyl is because heroin is illegal. That by prohibiting something like alcohol, our experience from alcohol is, well, people used to mostly drink wine and beer. We did went through the prohibition era. That's where we get the term bootleg because now people went to bath, bathtub gin because you could put a flask in your booth, boot and hide it. So bad guys, their prohibition creates a black market and demand for more potent, uh, less expensive versions of the alternative drug. And they say that's an iron law. So the answer is legalize everything. Well, we have legalized regulated drugs. That system has a lot of flaws in it, number one. And number two, all of that flies in the face with our recent 
documented experience with legalizing cannabis. We've legalized cannabis, and every place we've legalized cannabis, the black market has gone up, potency has gone up, and prices have dropped. Just what just what the, the legalize everything people say legalization would prevent. It doesn't prevent it. So again, I don't want to confront any, anybody, but let's challenge everyone. The safe safe supply, legalize everything, is not the answer. And you certainly can't legalize anything without educating people about it. Anything you legalize for an adult is going to get in the hands of, of a kid. And if that kid knows nothing about it because you spent all your money on harm reduction and legalization tactics without talking to prevention people, the kids are going to come across these new legal substances and be harmed. So we need to get these groups talking to each other and like come back off their defending their positions and say, none of us have all the answers. The numbers speak for themselves. If any one of these groups could say, if you'd just been doing it my way the last 50 years, none of this would have happened, not one of them can take that high ground. So let's admit that none of us have it right, and let's start talking to each other. Well, I, that's why I like to, at the very beginning of, of, of our discussion, make the different cohorts, because people have mm-hmm. different specialties, right? And the people who, you know, safe drug supply, they're thinking harm reduction. They're thinking mm-hmm. downstream for that population. And you know, maybe there's value of it, but they don't see the whole picture that on a society as a whole, you got babies dying of fentanyl. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that method doesn't work for the population as a whole. It may help the sub small highest, most difficult, you know, treatment cohort of of Mm -hmm. people. Um, So I think that that, that, that helps to know that. And also what I've noticed when you're talking to people is, even my profession as a physician, as a board certified in addiction medicine, my colleagues in addiction medicine, that's what they know and they're good at. Mm. They don't know the whole new science of prevention science, which is right. way more upstream, which is more a little bit what you're doing. That's not their expertise. They don't know about that. They didn't study that. So that's their, you know, I see the problem in discussions when people cross their specialty, apply what they know in their little circle to the rest of the population, and that's where we get into trouble. Yeah, and since I'm a layperson and I'm coming out this new, I have a lot more questions than answers. What we're really trying to do is, as difficult as it is, is be bridge builders. It's I'm and believe me, it's tough for me because it's way easier to burn bridges than it is to build them, um, and building them takes a lot of work. But that's the only way that 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 we that we get anywhere. Yeah. So I'm interested in talking to innovators, to people who are thinking outside the box and like you say prevention science. We know so much more now about how the brain works, how the adolescent brain works, how brain development works. How do we harness that and integrate that into our our drug education? Now, there are people out there in pockets who are on the leading edge of studying that, of implementing it. And that's really, those are the people I want to connect with. Because if we can use our national platform to curate the best drug education methods and communicate them as broad, help distribute them, I think that would be a valuable role because it, it would it'll accelerate uh, the solution to the problem of getting kids to understand what's going on. Uh, so neuroscience, I mean, we know so much more about how the brain works. And we also understand culturally how kids consume information in the age of Internet and social media. So let's use those tools. Right. And, and let's let's put those things together to have a, a very compelling drug education talk. You'll notice that I don't use the word prevention. Um and again, I have more questions than answers. I'd love to have the dialogue. But for me, it begs the question of what are you trying to prevent? Right. And so I kind of expect that just say no K-N-O-W. I, I, I prefer to just talk in terms of drug education. Kids should know cough syrup is a drug. And Billy, you don't get a spoonful of this medicine because your sister Sally did it because you're not sick. You don't have a fever and a cold. We're going to give it to her. And so you don't ever take any of that. And we have to start the education about what are substances, what goes in when, who makes those decisions for this next generation of kids, just because of the chemical soup that is on the black market today that they're going to be confronted with. So great. It's a great, con- these are all great conversations right. um, are good and we need to have them, right? Yeah, I, I like that. I like how, yeah, I'm really glad we got to, to talk in here. 
to hear from you thinking differently with a fresh, with fresh view. Um, going from downstream to midstream, um, I love, love, love your video on the fentapil. Um, mm. So, you know, really professional. Um, again, my expertise is I don't know if that reaches kids at that that uh, that age and that you, you'll have to test that market but it's a great yeah. uh information so i think midstream is doing that kind of education the, there's a dangers out there um mm -hmm. and also and you kind of mentioned it the, the danger of of, of mar marijuana and um i've had on this show parents like you whose kids died because of marijuana uh, cannabis-induced mm -hmm. psychosis, cannabis-induced um, suicide. The potency mm -hmm. out there is crazy. And and as a physician, I could tell you I have not treated a person who overdosed on fentanyl that didn't at one point in their life start their journey to drugs with marijuana. Not one. Yeah. So yeah. that's going upstream. And so I can't separate the conversation with fentanyl without mentioning marijuana if I want to move upstream. Then I don't know. What, you, what do you think of that? Uh, yeah, a couple of thoughts. First of all, it gets to uh, the delay onset of use, right? And we that's backed up by this what we know about how the adolescent brain develops. And I think that's a, a, a message that lands more with kids. Like you, this is not good for you now, right? We have a legal age for, for things for a reason, and there's science behind it. Um, and and so that's the one thing. Again, Although the legal, I'll just say one thing: the legal age—that's a political number. The yeah, science yeah. number is twenty-five. Right, right, right. And I'm just—that's just like an example I would give to a fourteen-year-old. It's like, look, there's legal ages for out for all kinds of stuff because young kids physically aren't developed enough to engage in certain things. Um, um, and and so when we get to the the different cohorts and we get to again, I. I break down people who use drugs into people who need drugs, people who sometimes use drugs, people who sell drugs. And, and then there's the kind of prior, prior to use or the experimental phase. Um, but for the weekend warriors, um, they need drug education too, and they need to, to know what's going on. Um, and so the position we take, for instance, on fentanyl test strips is, is, is nuanced, right? Um, I become convinced that these test strips detect fentanyl in very trace amounts when properly in samples, when properly tested. Our concern and what our warning about their limitation that we give to high school audiences is you really can't rely on that for pills because of the chocolate chip cookie effect. It, it, you just don't know unless it, because the distribution of the fentanyl has been packed into a into a pill. Um, a baggie of powder is different, and there are organizations that are promoting fentanyl test strips in bars and on college campuses. I'm convinced that getting people to test cocaine before they use it will save a lot of lives. Um, now, there's nitazines coming down the pike. There are certain, you know, xylazine is in stuff now. Fentanyl test strips don't pick up that up. It doesn't solve the whole chemical soup problem, but. I'm not saying that's that's not a good, it's a very good solution for that midstream 20-something. And the mindset we have to go over, we hear anecdotes of, I was at a party and somebody put a baggie, pulled a baggie of cocaine out and I said, I have a test strip here in my purse. And they said, we don't need that. We trust our guy. Mm. Yes. Okay. And so, and so again, there's again, this mindset of education and getting the message through to people that we still have work to do even among, and, and some of the people in my audience are shocked to hear about how prevalent cocaine is, but it, it has not gone away. Right. And there are people in their thirties and forties doing it on, on weekends all the time. Those people are at risk because of contaminated cocaine. Yeah. Um, so we need to get to them as well. And we also I, I hear stories. The most educated ones, the, you know, cause I've had patients in the emergency department who use uh, cocaine and, you know, they're there for an adverse outcome. And I said, you know, there's an issue with fentanyl. Do you, you know, I, I'll offer them. Do you want me to test to see if you were exposed to that? Um, and they'll say, no, I, I know how to test. We tested our drugs. That's great. And how about, wow. And then there's a whole, other population and they're they have such a severe substance use disorder they go yeah i probably have fentanyl in my meth but you know whatever and they don't yes they're not gonna right. eat the strips that, yeah that's right and so it's everything we're doing in a sense globally speaking is harm reduction because we're not going to protect everyone from 
from the dangers of black market substances. Um, but the more knowledge people have, the better equipped they are to make decisions. Right. And I consider, as I, I, I thought, oh, we keep our conversation, uh, that, that the fentanyl strips, I, I feel, is a downstream approach. Mm -hmm. And then midstream is like like your analogy with, uh, you know, Weekend Warrior. And upstream, and I see that you're working on that, upstream is plugging the hole in in the boat. And if you go upstream enough um, in the whole drug issue, then you're covering things uh, as far as managing stress and anxiety and that hole that you have in yourself that makes you want to use drugs in the first place. And yeah. and then that's the, your whole campaign I saw of skills over pills or mm -hmm. um, farm over pharma and, and mm -hmm. such. Yeah. It, and we say that all the things that maybe your hippie grandma used to talk about, <laughs> about you know, getting exercise and sunshine and prayer and meditation and, you know, yoga and human connection and art and creativity. Uh, again, going back to the science, how can we tell young kids that you can make the same changes chemically and electrically in your brain that these drugs bring on? You can do that organically. And the more kind of volatile and, and unpredictable and risky the black market drug supply becomes, the more of those tactics become like critical life skills. You really have to learn how to use, to manage your stress organically. I'm frankly a little concerned just culturally about uh, a movement I'm starting to see about um, really normalizing medicating stress and anxiety. You know, there's online sources that's now not, for- That's not new, right? That'd be, yeah, yeah, it's not new, but it's- it be for our like, generation. I'm, yeah. I'm convinced if I was born in this era, I would have been put on some ADD meds. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was all over the place. Yeah. Um, and again, but, uh, I have more questions than answers, but I'm seeing advertisements uh, for companies saying, we will ship you your anxiety medications after a 20 minute consult with someone. And I'm like, well, have you tried any of these other things first? We haven't broken out of this kind of quick fix. There's a pill for every ill mindset in our culture on top of the, uh, the stress and anxiety that I think is caused by putting really high expectations on young kids. And at the same time, taking all boundaries away. So, you know, child psychologists and so forth will tell you young people need to take risk, which means they have to push limits and push boundaries. Well, if you take all the limits and boundaries off of them, I, I think they become disoriented. At the same time, you say your generation needs to fix climate change, world hunger, cancer and war. Uh, you know, these kids are like and then they see all the FOMO that goes on on social media. So maybe our kids are stressed out so much that they have a higher need for medical intervention than, than we ever did. But I, I would wish that we could get back to, as someone who's been sober for seven and a half years, I'm like, sobriety is a superpower. You guys should try it. You know, I mean, there are ways to do this that are much less risky than this kind of YouTube influencer so that that's what prevention science says about going way upstream and you're you're doing that um with your whole managing stress part because if you mm -hmm. teach kids you know really as soon as you're born i'm a little 10 month old you know you know she like you know whatever even maybe that's going a little too upstream but i mean cry when you want something instead of like you can figure it out you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> or or um you know that's like an extreme example of a baby but it, it continues on in life of being able to teach how to regulate your own emotion i mean you're never going to get away from stress you're always going to have stress and emotion and things happen in life how do you deal with that? Teaching that at an elementary age. Mm -hmm. And that's what Prevention Science did is have programs where they teach kids at that young, going to like seventh grade, these life skills. And if you mm -hmm. teach those life skills at that age, going downstream, you'll see less substance use, mental health issues, anxiety, mm -hmm. violence, you know, um, things like that that happen um, in society if you start um, way upstream. And, you know, so yeah. so we can that's what real upstream is. Teaching yeah. those four skills, um, mm. plugging that hole, teaching people how to plug their own hole with other things besides yeah. drugs. Yeah. Um, 
versus way downstream, we need naloxone, we need the safe mm. supply. Um, yeah, we're just, and, and, and we really want to get more involved in that. One of the things we want to do at Song for Charlie, again, is connect with innovators who are thinking um, the kind of bleeding edge on this kind of stuff. So the content that we put together, we are going to continue to look at ways to make it more immersive, interactive, video-based, as opposed to, you know, black ink on a white background, because that's the way all of us prefer to consume information now. You know, we're just, we're having conversations with a cool new startup company called Be Me, which is an, a mental health app for youth, and it has no social media uh aspect to it at all. So you don't do it to connect with your friends, but you do it to connect with tools you can customize for whatever's going on with you, like holistic kind of coping and stuff like that. So we want to connect with people like that, post their resources on our website and be a, a, a repository for families um, using our national platform to connect. That's kind of our vision going forward. And I also, that's one thing. And then the other thing I saw on your website that got me like, hmm, this is interesting about report your drug dealer. Mm, yeah, it's, um, and again, we're getting into so many, so I know, I know Rocky Heron is fond of saying this. Um, you know, it took us 50 years to get into this mess. It might take us 50 years to get out. Um, and so there are deep cultural norms that I think we need to revisit, like breaking out drug sellers from drug users, right? Um, similar is, you know, there's this whole resistance to snitching among young people. They don't, it, it's not cool. I mean, it's never been cool, right? To rat out your friends. It's really, they're in a tough situation. So how do you get them comfortable with saying, you know, these platforms are making it easier for you to report drug dealers to them. And they're taking faster action because drug selling on their, on their sites is a business disaster for them. And so they're working on it. Is this like, are you saying like Amazon, like, you know, I bought, you know, my, uh, this shirt online, but it was too big or too small. Is that what you kind of mean? Or? No, what I'm saying is if a kid sees a drug menu posted on Snapchat, there's a myth out there that, like if, if I take a screenshot of that, um, the, the person who posted it will know who took the screenshot. So I, I can't knock on that person because he'll know who I am. It's like, number one, I, I'm not sure that's technically true. It might depend on your settings, but there are also ways to, you know, press like the three buttons at the top right hand corner of that screen and just report that post anonymously without taking a screenshot. And and I say to some of my high school audiences, and this might be a little rough and, and uh, it's not quite polished enough in terms of an analogy, but it's like slinging these pills is not just drug dealing. It's not because nobody knows what's in those pills. It's a really risky, potentially deadly activity. It's less like you're not turning your friend into and guns. That's the analogy I use is if you knew one of your friends or someone you knew was going to bring a had a Glock in their backpack. Would you tell someone? It's more like that than somebody selling pot behind the gym, right? So how, but that's a really tough mindset to get through of getting kids comfortable with saying, but this is what I hope they'll do. I'm gonna make that behavior socially unacceptable. I don't, nobody pulls out a baggie of pills at my party and says, hey, anybody want one of these? The answer should be, where did you get those? No, you take, get those pills out of my party. Don't you know about fentanyl? Nobody does that. That is not cool. And so it's it's a it's a cultural level, hopefully, change that we can start to bring about with some of these kids. And turning in drug dealers is for parents, it's a no-brainer. If you see some of that activity, you need to report it to the trust and safety people right away. Um, but kids, how do you get them to feel comfortable with going, you know, this guy just tried to friend me? I took a look at that and he's got drugs on his site. I'm not just going to block them, I'm going to report them. It would be great if we could get some more of that going on. Interesting. I like your analogy. Like, you know, you would you would do that for guns, right? You would yeah. do it for a sex offender, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, but drugs have kind of fallen into this level of acceptability of, well, it's not, it's, well, it's a risky, it's, but it would be acceptable. More than that. I think we're, you're fighting a whole culture uh, mm -hmm. in America that's trying to normalize drugs. Yes. Right. Um, and you're fighting that stream. So because there's people who, yeah, said, you know, yeah, I you use you have a glass of wine. Why shouldn't I be allowed to use cocaine? And right. in, in, the, in movies and popular culture, That's right there. it's everywhere. 
Right. right. And then the pills are everywhere and take a Xanax. And, and it's a joke about, you know, how many um, now we're just riffing here. But I, I and now that my antenna's up, I see it all the time. It seems to be that a lot of kind of kind of lighthearted, not rom-coms, but like comedies. There always seems to be a vignette or a subplot about a bunch of middle aged people uh, take some ecstasy and go out of the town and have a crazy, wild drug fueled night. It's like, does that have to be in every movie? <laughs> well, probably in every movie. So I'm going to go upstream in your analogy. <laughs> every movie, there's someone like, oh, I'm so stressed out. I need a cigarette. I need yeah. a wine. I need a, instead of, I need to go on a run. I need a Yeah, wine. right. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. right. And there's a lot of, does anybody have a Xanax? I mean, you see that, you yeah, know. But <laughs> that, that actually, I, that once makes me want to tear my head, hair yeah. off because you could die. Mm. Yeah, and, and by the way, benzo addiction is no laughing matter either, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, no, no, we're it's, making it's, very light, we're making light subjects of, of potentially very serious scenarios. Yeah. Ed, this has been amazing. I, uh, great conversation, great insights. Everyone needs to go to Song of Charlie. Check out your amazing videos and platforms. And and you have really a way. And, and this is what you're focused on, on how do you get into the mind? We have all this information and data, but how do you get that to the young people who need to know that and, and their parents? And so I want to say thank you to Christina Ivazes from Placer County for your important question and your very important work in prevention. And thank you, Ed, for joining us. Hi, Truths. Um, you bring a blessing to Charlie's memory and helping many other parents. And so I want to give you a blessing for your work, too. Thanks very much, Doctor. And thanks for everything you do. You do important work yourself. Thank you. Thank you for listening to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. This week's episode would not be possible without the generous support from our sponsor, a sincere and warm thank you to FAF, Families Against Fentanyl. Visit familiesagainstfentanyl.org and sign the petition to declare illegal fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction. Make drug dealers think twice and three times before peddling killer drugs. Our producer is Dave Rivas from Davy Boy Productions. I am your host, Dr. Ronit Lev. We hope we brought your day a little bit more high truths.